Hey, Robert. Hey, Ron. So there's a, a, a lot of uh, interesting economic news coming out and uh, a lot of, you know, the market's responding. Market is is down over the last few weeks uh, as a consequence. So there seems to be this paradox. On the one hand, it looks like um, unemployment is low. The U.S. economy is buzzing forward. There's a lot of uh, construction of manufacturing plants um subsidized by the government to a large extent there's uh there's a lot of activity and the economy seems to be growing and seems to be doing okay um but on the other hand there seems to be a lot of pessimism a lot of malay a lot of people uh who seem to be struggling uh interest rates are high so it's difficult to buy a home uh, mortgages are very expensive it's uh, car loans are expensive so a lot you know, people, interest rates on credit cards have gone through the roof. Uh, people are uh, taking on a lot of debt in spite of this. The government, of course, has huge amounts of debt uh, at this point. How do we reconcile? How, what does ingenuism, put it this way, what does ingenuism have to contribute to trying to reconcile kind of the the, the con contradictory um, signals that we're getting in the marketplace? Well, I think that, first of all, we need to acknowledge that if you go back 25 years, interest rates don't look high at all. They actually look quite low. Uh, but it's not yep. 25 years ago. It's not the 90s. It's the 2020s. And we do have a different economy than we've had in a long time. Uh, the fact that it keeps chugging ahead is you know, what we started talking about here is the miracle of the 21st century is, is we were in a phenomena that's very difficult to stop. It's not impossible to stop, but it takes more than the normal level of mistakes that we're, we're currently seeing. Uh, and that's in the United States. In uh, other parts of the world, I think that actually ingenuism has been largely reined in and we're seeing the impact of that in those countries. But sticking to the US at first, uh, you know, there's always a, a paradox when you are at this I'll say point in the cycle, although there is no cycle, there is no predictable, there's no constant yep. amplitude or fre frequency or anything. But the, at this point, there is always a paradox of uh, there's concern about a recession and the Fed is active. And so the concern is if the economy is too strong, the Fed will uh, overshoot whatever is necessary on monetary policy to rein in inflation. Uh, and then the economy will crash uh, versus if the economy is, they, they, you know, they call it the Goldilocks economy, not too hot, not too cold, it's just right. Then the Fed can stop, it can, uh, you know, have a long pause, they could start cutting rates if inflation continues to go down. And so you always get this weird paradox where the, the economy, the market and sentiment seem to diverge at this point in the cycle. Uh, but I do think that the U.S. economy has been shockingly robust uh, since March of 2020, since mm -hmm. COVID. I mean, we were really pleasantly surprised that COVID, while certain activities were, they screeched to a halt, mostly because they were forbidden, uh, that most activity, the production of food, the production of, of entertainment, the production of um, uh, of basically all the necessities of life, you know, even the toilet paper shortage was short. Production of Amazon. <laughs> yes, uh, that the things just kept moving along despite this enormous um, upheaval. And today we have much smaller concerns than a global pandemic. And so it's not surprising to me that the economy has rebounded because we have this very strong tide to swim with, the fact that people are so connected the fact that at least in the private sector, there's been a real movement and adaptation of the kind of things that you've always seen at 3M or at Apple, of trying things and, and really evolving the things that work on a rapid basis. So the U.S. economy has a lot going for it. Now, there are other, other aspects, uh, and it may be that the economic growth right now and some of the sentiment is, is due to the fact that in the numbers, you, know, you count sort of all activity equally when what really matters is productive activity. And that's uh, not guaranteed moment to moment, every project to project in 
uh, people's individual lives or corporates, corporations' individual lives, but it is guaranteed over time because you have a very strong feedback mechanism in the market. Yeah, and I think one of the things that people don't appreciate about the the, the economy is the role in genuism plays and, and the importance it has in producing that which generates economic growth, which is really entrepreneurial activity, new businesses, or existing businesses discovering new ways of doing business and implementing those. And that kind of dynamism seems to be still alive and well in much of the uh, tech industry and even in some of the other industries. Uh, you know, as long as there's some economic freedom and people, uh, you, we haven't fundamentally changed the attitude towards failure yet. We haven't fundamentally changed the culture that is very entrepreneur driven and very experiment, experiment driven. The world is still connected. It's getting maybe a little less connected with things like China and everything, but it's it's still well connected. The drivers of economic growth, the ingenuism drivers of economic growth are still alive and well. Yes, and I, I don't think we should be complacent about that. Yeah. And there's certainly more that we could be doing you know, from the, the top. But of course, we started talking more about the bottom up because that's really more consistent with ingenuism. But as people, uh, you know, whatever you call it, but as people adopt this attitude towards progress of being connected with other people, of continuously learning, of taking feedback, recognizing failure as a lesson and you know, trying again or trying something else, depending on what the feedback was, there's an awful lot of momentum in our daily lives and in our leading corporations and even our leading institutions. You know, unfortunately, that, that uh, particular uh, mindset does not seem to exist in Washington, D.C. on either side of the table. Uh, you know, we're seeing the potential for a, a government shutdown, which is you know, all driven by politics and the need to create certain or desire to create certain appearances. Uh, and we have you know, massive initiatives that don't show any of the characteristics of ingenuism, of starting with small investments to see what works, to learn, and then ramping up to larger investments once you have figured out what learns. Now, you know, we, what, what works, we uh, seem to still be doing the old throw a bunch of money at it and then consider the problem solved, which means you build a trains that don't work or that uh, don't give you what you were actually looking for. And by the time you, you recognize that you already spent $76 billion and of course you can't quit now. So you just keep throwing good money after bad. Yeah. Uh, and th that's the most discouraging part about the U.S. economy to me is that at the more centralized levels, I don't see any evidence of ingenuism blossoming. You know, we had opportunities in COVID and some were fulfilled on, you know, the vaccine is our favorite example. But those are exactly what, what ingenuism calls for is you make a lot of small investments and then you figure out quickly what's working and then you ramp that up and it, you know, it's overstating to say it saves the world, but it's not overstating a lot. And of course, ideally at the federal level, what we'd like to see is, is just get out of the way and, and allow these kind of investments to be made. If they're good investments, the private sector is likely to make them. And, and uh, you know, the biggest problem we probably face in America today are the barriers to uh, engaging in productive activities, the regulatory barriers, the zoning barriers, the environmental barriers that seem to be a constraint rather than a plus. And what is coming out of Washington, uh, as you said, big spending amounts on factories that nobody is really sure make any sense in the future. It's big amounts of money and big white elephants might be being built. Uh, there's the chip plants in Phoenix that uh, TSMC keeps saying, uh, we're building it, but we're not quite sure exactly who's going to work in it or what exactly it's going to be producing because we don't know what the market's going to be like. But if you subsidize, we will build and and they're doing it. And I, I just read a story about a big a Ford mini plant that was going to make batteries, uh, $3.5 billion. And they just stopped saying, and, and the article quotes Ford as saying, we're not sure we can productively manage this plant. So we're going to pause it for now and we'll see if we ever resume it. Again, motivated primarily by the subsidies, by these big investments rather than by, 
allowing ingenuism to 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 work. The private sector is very good at seeding little things and seeing what blossoms. No, that uh, so you're not wrong in my opinion, uh, and it's the easy answer because we know that feedback is strong in the the private sector. It, it just is a uh, both a, a profit motivation and a failure um, punishment if a company does well or a company does poorly. Uh, I would I, so you know I, I would like if there was more activity shifted and there were fewer uh, top down regulation like that's all consistent with ingenuism. What also would be consistent is to apply the principles to the large behemoth. Uh, that's never uh, seems to happen on a regular basis. So it's easy to give up on it. Uh, and it's also easy to hand wave it. You get things like the entrepreneurial state where you just you know sort of cherry pick the evidence or the stories to say, look, the government can be just as uh, productive and just as ingenuous as uh, a company can be. And it's not, and, but then you let them off the hook because you just say they can be. And if the top 10% of government projects, which wouldn't surprise me, are you know extremely productive, you, you have to focus on the other 90%. That's exactly what corporations do, either improving them or getting rid of them. And so I, I would be very excited if uh, there were initiatives coming out of, of Washington that were taking a serious look at how we're going to try and accomplish these goals instead of just saying, okay, we've allocated $160 billion, check that box and move on. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that would be any easier than getting, you know, changing the, the, the general mindset of uh, Washington, D.C. than having them give up power, but it, it very likely might be. Mm -hmm. uh, and neither of that's going to happen out of this this uh, podcast episode, but no, but there might be also something structurally in terms of incentives that makes this, at the very least, very very difficult to do. And and the reality is that it's not just American government that we're worried about, right? I mean, it's it's if we look at a global phenomena, there's just no governments that are very good at that. Maybe people point out Singapore, right, is is maybe a place where they've done this uh, uh, successfully, but. Uh, we're seeing the struggles the Chinese government is having right now uh, with that economy and what is going on. And, and they are moving in a non-ingenuous direction of, of government solutions, big solutions, again, rather than kind of letting the market do what – the beauty of ingenuism is the market does the ingenuism thing, right? It, it does it organically. Uh, it, 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 if you just get out of the way, that's what actually happens. Well, it's not, I, you consistently see across all sorts of different sort of organizations that the bigger the organization, the less ingenuous it tends sure. to be, um, both across sectionally and over time. Uh, and we also see counterexamples that suggest it doesn't have to be that way, but there's definitely some sort of force that uh, drives things in that direction. And of course, you know, a, a, the U.S. economy is the biggest economy in the world, and so the U.S. government is likely to be pretty damn uningenuous. And the Chinese economy is the second biggest economy in the world, <clears throat> and the same is what you would expect. Now, in, in China, though, there's just sort of different mores and uh, expectations such that uh, you know we've had this massive swing. Now, it's taken a, a decade but we've had a massive swing from having a central government, so a top-down entity that is fairly supportive of ingenuism and it's wildly successful to it no longer being supportive of ingenuism, that is solutions being dictated from above rather mm -hmm. than being allowed to grow from below. And I'm not sure what changed. I mean, there was there was a, a time and you know, counter to your your sort of blanket statement, there was a time where the Chinese government actually increased the amount of ingenuism that was allowed in China uh, and in even encouraged it to a degree because it was so low when they started to a degree that, you know, it was arguably unprecedented without revolution. Uh, and it was wildly successful. Uh, and one of the lessons of ingenuism would be you learn from that <laughs> 
and you keep doing what works, but not a lot of countries seem to have learned. You know, they prefer to point to Singapore, which is basically the size of, I don't know, the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah. I mean, it's a Less. It's not comparable to the entirety of the US or the uh, the entirety of China. Uh, but we've had this swing and now we're we're seeing what do they say the chickens come home to roost and it's going to be very difficult without a counter swing which seems to be and again i don't know why it went one way or why it went the other i think that's one of the most interesting questions of recent history uh, but we can see the impact on the chinese economy well i mean i think anyway i mean from my reading which is limited it seems like they were so poor they need to do something and uh, and and allowing for people to be entrepreneurial and to to connect. I mean, they opened up uh, under Mao. There was no connection, right? Not intern inside China, and certainly not outside. Suddenly, they opened everything up, and they allowed that until the people in power felt that that openness threatened their own power, uh, and and that's because their their objective function is a little different than the objective function we assume. Uh, under under ingenuism, I thought one other aspect of the China, which I read yesterday, one of these real estate companies that is going bankrupt, that is that is really in trouble, um, they they basically put the CEO in jail, uh, not under any claims of fraud or anything like that yet, but just for failing basically, uh, and and of course that is the exact opposite of the approach uh, we advocate for or ingenuism advocates for. But it is it is uh, it is interesting how they deal with these kind of things in in that culture. We're not yet at that point in the United States, luckily. Uh, yes, I'm sure there are um, dozens of politicians in Washington D.C. who would love to put Elon Musk in jail, but uh, they're not able to. And that that is part of when we talk about a supportive environment. You know, it's we think of it as being more something that is, is intentional. Um, you know, the way you describe it, and I'm not arguing with it because I don't know yeah. anything about it, uh, but uh, China sort of stumbling in for lack of any other options to an ingenuous approach to progress. Uh, and then it being wildly successful uh, to a point where, you know, there's uh, today the U S government has its own industrial policy and it's, doing it, in my opinion, terribly, not because of the particular choices or the areas they're investing in, uh, although I, you know, I have my own thoughts about that, but, but the way they're doing it is very top-down, very bulky, not at all experimental. You know, it's, it's if there is success, it will be luck. Uh, and so you can do that for a long time incrementally uh, and, and think you're not harming progress, even though you are, because you're, you know, moving growth from 4% to 2% or in China from, from 10% to, to 6%. But at some point, the pendulum actually, it's like an inflection point where the, uh, the lack of ingenuism starts to create observable problems, not just opportunity cost, but observable problems. And then of course, the solutions are all top down. And while you know those can mask often mask problems for years, uh, in the end the you know, economics wins out in the end. And it isn't something that's unique to the uh, to governments. You know, it, it happened in the financial sector in the U.S. Although there was a lot of government involvement in two thousand the two thousands up through two thousand and eight. Uh, but it is in in my opinion. Uh, it is only there's only one way out for the Chinese economy, and it, it would require a complete reversal that you know, might be politically impossible. Uh, but otherwise, this trend that we're seeing now is just going to get worse. Yeah. And I worry, of course, about the U.S. trend, not only because of the, the this industrial policy, but also like the Chinese government, it seems like the U.S. is turning against its entrepreneurs or its 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 very successful companies. Um, we we we've seen over the last couple of weeks two big antitrust actions: one it's against Google, and yesterday against Amazon. And you read you read the claims they make, and as as from an economics perspective, put aside the legal whatever, it's just the claims are ludicrous, and yet. Um, they have a good chance in court. 
Uh, I, I wonder, because it'll take a while. And both yep. of them, the irony, of course, is, and the same thing happened with Microsoft in its big antitrust case, is that the things that the, the FTC is focused on are the things that have just become less relevant. Yep. Uh, you know, AI is definitely um, has the potential to not just break Google's, you know, I, I'll say it, virtual monopoly on search, not as a search offering, but in terms yep. of what people use. Now, monopoly is in terms of offering, if you want to be, uh, you, if you want to argue the economics of it, you have to say there are no other providers, but Google is as massive market share and AI potentially puts Google out of business. You know, if no one needs to search in the same way that they historically have, what does Google have anymore? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing with Amazon, um, you know, Amazon finally has, you know, you can order on Walmart and it's basically the same experience as Amazon and it has competitors coming from all directions, you know, people who are going to sell for less, but not provide fast delivery. People are going to sell for more, but provide uh, more personalized items and, and of course mass market with, with Walmart. And AI is going to change that too. I mean, why even bother with Amazon if I can just tell my personal assistant, AI personal assistant, go buy me X and it will do the shopping, find me the best deal based on my parameters, delivery, personalized, whatever, in whatever store you 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 might expect fragmentation of retail with uh, personal assist, AI personal assistants. Who knows? That's the beauty of experimentation. Yes, and there are already um, services offering that, that that you basically say this is what I'm looking for. And you know, there's a lot of shopping is browsing and Amazon has advantages and Amazon does a really good job. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think they're less likely to disappear, but to you know, argue that they're a monopolist is, is ludicrous, but then mm -hmm. to argue it today <laughs> when whatever <laughs> monopoly or market power, market power is more accurate that they've ever had has certainly begun to diminish. Uh, it just, it, it's. It, it reminds me of not so much a Microsoft case, but the, the IBM case where IBM dominated the mainframe. And by the time the court case wound its way through the court system, PCs were out and IBM mainframes were about to become irrelevant. And uh, it seems like history repeats. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, we will uh, talk next week. Thanks, Robert. All right. Thanks, Ron. Cool. Bye. Bye.